Good morning. I am Trent. If we haven't met, good morning online as well. Good to have you all in the house. Uh, it's Palm Sunday, so it shouldn't be surprising if you follow the Version app on your phone we talk about here every once in a while. Uh, the verse of the day has to do with that. This is Jesus riding into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. You find it in Luke chapter 19. People laid down the palm branches and said, Blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Dozens, hundreds of people believed that Jesus was exactly who he said he was. And we know there's a trial coming up at the end of the week, uh, pretty fixed, uh, an actual crucifixion, a death. Uh, but many, many people had seen him do what he did, heard him say what he said, and were, were sold. And they said, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Almost exactly what the angel said about 33 years before when he was born. So we certainly celebrate that day as we enter this week we call Holy Week. And as Chase said, the second week, he started just last week, taking a look at the words that Jesus said on the cross. Uh, today's, I'm going to throw it out right from the top so you get it in your brain, uh, and then I'll give you the context. As Jesus replied, we have to find out who he replied to, but we'll get to that. I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, Seven percent of you remember that four hours later this afternoon from me reading it. Uh, stats say over 30 percent of you will, believe, will actually remember it if you say it out loud. So read this with me. Here we go. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. So maybe set the context of this first, uh, where it fits in the story, even before we look at the story itself and see who said this or who it was said to. So that would simply go back to last week, because this story we're going to look at in Luke chapter 23 comes right after the words Chase used last week. So those, just before it, in Luke 23 said this, two others both criminals were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. And then the words from last week, Jesus said, Father, forgive them. So they don't know what they're doing. And the soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice, nearly oblivious to what was going on. But in that moment of literally dying, one of three people, Jesus looked around, and one of his thoughts were, Father, would you forgive them? That they don't know what they're doing. So if you missed last week, go jump online, check that out. Uh, powerful words from Jesus, even at that moment. Uh, right after that, though, we get to our story. If you skip down past our story, I want to throw one other verse in. Uh, we're not going to go down to verse 47, but at the end of that, it says, the Roman officer overseeing the execution saw what had happened. He worshiped God and said, surely this man was innocent. The Roman officer, centurion in charge, checks out what's going on here. He said Jesus certainly was innocent. He worshiped God. That's crazy. When he saw, it said, what had happened? What happened? Well, this is one of the times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have an account of the crucifixion, the, the trial of the crucifixion, the resurrection for that matter. Uh, not a single contradiction for people because they all saw it firsthand. Of course, it's true. But just as if four of us reported an accident up at the corner after church, our stories would vary based on the, the focus of what we saw or what mostly impacted us. Uh, so if we put all those Gospels together, uh, there was an earthquake in the middle of this crucifixion. At noon, the middle of the day, the sky went totally black, darkness, from 12 to 3. It's like, what is going on? The temple curtain separating the Holy of Holies ripped from the top to the bottom. How'd they do that? I mean, a couple angels flew down there like a pen knife thing. Yeah, it, crazy, but that, that's the point. This was major. And last little fact, a bunch of dead people came out of the grave and walked around town. So he said, what's this Roman centurion reacting to? What happened? Was well, mom walked by and she died 10 years ago. I mean, it got people's attention when they saw what had happened. In another account uh, referring to them, 
the, uh, the officers. I think there's one more. Uh, actually, it goes to the crowd. The, uh, the officers, the ones in charge said, truly he was the son of God, quote unquote. Meanwhile, while the Roman leaders are saying that, the crowd's saying this. This is the start of our story. Uh, oh, they, they got that. Man. We're good here. The crowd watched, and the leader scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he's really God's Messiah, the chosen one. A little sarcastic. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. So again, I, I, I doubt that many crucifixions had a big crowd. But Jesus, again, had so impacted Jerusalem from his ministry, people followed out there. And while the Roman centurion was going, man, I think he's the son of God. We're terrified. This is crazy, all this stuff going on. Other people are just standing by making fun of him. He saved others. Uh, if he's really the God beside the chosen, let him save himself. Uh, it, sa- it says in Matthew that even the revolutionaries crucified with him ri- ridiculed him in the same way. So everybody's just kind of making fun at the start of our story here, uh, totally mocking Jesus and who he was. Uh, Pilate, I think, does something really interesting. He's down to verse 38. A sign was fastened above him with these words. This is the king of the Jews. Pilate, who, cru- who sentenced him to death, is the one who makes these little signs or authorizes them to say what that person had done. We believe one was a revolutionary against the Roman government. We believe the other was a robber, a thief. Uh, we know in John, John 19, when it talks about this a little more in depth, it says, Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. The sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. <laughs> All three lines more like a billboard. But he did that so that many people could read it. Then the leading priest objected and said to Pilate, change it from the king of the Jews to he said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate replied, nope. What I have written, I have written. So all the crowd, the religious leaders, are kind of just partying with this and making fun of Jesus. The Roman centurion, the governor Pilate, have been clearly moved right to the heart, right to the core, to know that this truly was Jesus. This is the king of the Jews. Now, as many other examples, uh, we have already read uh, that, the other, that the criminals both ridiculed Jesus. That was from Matthew. Here in Luke, it tells us a little more. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So we both know they joined in the ridicule. But Luke somehow has this exact conversation. I assume it just happened later in the course of the day because they're there all day long. So one of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself and us too while you're at it. (laughs) But the other criminal protested. Don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes. But this man hasn't done anything wrong. I admit that I'm a sinner. I am wrong. He is not. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I would love more context here. I wish I could flip over into the gospel and have half a chapter of who this guy exactly was. There's a whole book about who the two criminals are as far as uh, tradition. And we don't know how accurate it is. but wouldn't it be cool to know maybe this guy, uh, the second criminal, helped pass the fish out when Jesus fed 5,000? Or maybe it was his cousin that had been the invalid for over 30 years by the pool that was healed by Jesus. We, we just don't know. Maybe that's the first time you ever met him, hanging next to him on a cross, dying together. But he had seen what had happened so far that day, at least. And his inclination was, stop picking on him, making fun of him. He is who he said he is. And he turns to Jesus and said, Jesus, this is probably crazy, but would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? I know you're the king. I know you're going to have a kingdom. Would you remember me? And then we get today's words from the cross. Jesus said, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. 
And we're just going to look at three little phrases from that. But first, uh, one commentator made a kind of an interesting point. Uh, I wrote them out for you. The fact that one of the lessons from the, this part of the cross, I believe, is bottom line, Christ will not force himself on anyone. Not on the people who put him on the cross, not the people that sentenced him, not the ones that lied in his trial, not the two guys next to him. He'll not force himself on anyone. He makes himself available to everyone. Will not force himself on anyone, makes himself available to everyone. The choice is always ours. Here we have a real live example. Jesus, two people, one responding, one not responding. So the, the, the first criminal uh, may be very close to the means of salvation and still miss it, literally hanging next to Jesus on the cross. Could have the same response as the second criminal. He chose instead to just ridicule and mock and not believe. The other criminal, however, in the process of dying, the second criminal saw who Jesus was. He had heard Jesus praying for the soldiers and forgiving them. He wanted what Jesus offered. He wanted to be with Jesus. So he said, Jesus, would you remember me? I, 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 don't, I don't know. It's going to be fun someday to ask him, what, what did you think Jesus was going to say? And what did you think Jesus could do for you right there at that point? But I do believe he had possibly known Jesus in the past or certainly heard of him. Most people had. He had seen Jesus respond to the people crucifying him at those words last week, asking for their forgiveness even before they asked it. And maybe in other conversation during the day, we don't know what went on, but it was enough to get to that guy's second criminal's heart for him to say, Jesus, please remember me. And Jesus said, I tell you, today you'll be with me in paradise. So this bottom line, kind of less side lesson one, not from the words, but from the story. Salvation simply always gives us an opportunity to respond to God's love. Uh, my fav- one of my favorite verses I use here often, 1 Peter 3.15, Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. That phrase is in the Hebrews. We did that last year in a series. Time and time again, especially chapter 7, 8, 9, 10. Once for all time, once for all time, once for all time. For all the sins of all the people, if we simply seek his forgiveness. He died once for all time. He never sinned, but he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. Just, I love that phrase, safely home to God. You think of the story of the prodigal son. If you've ever read that in a while. For the, the prodigal son running off doing whatever he wants. But when he came home, he was warmly received by the Father. And we we are designed for a relationship with Jesus. That's what God created us for. You say, why, did, why doesn't everybody have one? Well, we resist it. We know that. The Bible calls that sin. And we resist it, keep God at arm's length, kind of live our own life, do our own thing. And it, simply by doing our own thing, we're not always doing God's thing. It's called sin. But God openly restored that to everyone that would respond by sending Jesus to this weekend that we celebrate coming up Easter who did die to pay the penalty for my sin. And all we do is respond to what God did and say, I choose to follow Jesus. Please forgive me. And we remain in a relationship with him here on earth with direction for our day-by-day day from this, his word, but also literally forever. So we have that opportunity to have that relationship. But back to the cross, second criminal. Uh, Jesus says, I assure you today you will be with me in paradise. Let's, let's think for a second. I assure you. This, this kind of struck me because I don't think we're sure of a whole lot of things in our culture today. There's a lot of unknowns. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's certainly some anxiety slash fear. What are you really sure of? And in this terrible moment, this criminal's dying, a criminal's death on a cross. At that moment, this conversation happens. And Jesus said, I assure you. Some of you think the, the background is falling down. Uh, it's actually a sermon illustration. Because <laughs> sometimes you're headed in a direction and you get off track. And you find yourself where you're not sure how you got there. Now, this criminal says, hey, I, we deserve this. I know how I got here. But we get in really tough places, really hopeless places. And then maybe it feels like you're off track. But Jesus says, that might look like that to you, feel like that to you. I assure you. The other, the other 37 arrows, I didn't count, are still all pointing in the right direction. 
I assure you, I can get you back on track. Uh, we did a series in Colossians. This is the verse I pulled from that. Uh, I think kind of the coolest verse about this assurance of where we're headed is Colossians 3, 1 and 2. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven. That, that's where we, I, I preached this passage. We just lived in that realities Scripture says there is a heaven. It's not some myth thing. It's you know, up there in the clouds of the heart playing with the angels. Not heaven. It's real. So set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. Because it's real, we should be thinking about it. And the illustration I used is planning a vacation. How many of you have a vacation planned sometime coming up this year? All right, some of you guys need to get out more. You need a break. <laughs> but when we, when we set a vacation, we think, first, it's real. You have reservations. You have money down. You have the VRBO booked or whatever. But you think about it. You post it on Facebook. Like, that's important. Like, people want to know where you're going. Just makes them jealous. Stop doing that. No, just kidding. Post what I want. But when you do that, what do they do? Go, oh, you're going to Daytona Beach? Eat at Hog Heaven. Or they say, you're going to Daytona Beach? Don't eat at, and I won't tell you. Uh, he said, do this, do this, rent this, see this. People are all, all full of suggestions for you to think about. I Google almost every time I go to a new place. Top 25 things to do in Phoenix. And I always tell you some really bizarre stuff you would have never heard about otherwise. You go check it out. It's fun. All of that is thinking about the reality that I'm going somewhere. And off track or otherwise... Jesus says, I assure you, you're going somewhere. I promise this is going to happen. So, so fix your idea, your concept of where you're headed as someone that's going to end up in heaven. Uh, Max Lucado's next to latest book is Begin Again. Perfect title for a thief hanging on a cross whose life is over and it looks really, really like a bad ending. <laughs> but Jesus says, I assure you, you can begin again. And a couple of his opening statements say this in the intro. God is a God of fresh starts. Isn't that cool? He's the author of the new chapter, the architect of the new design, the voice behind the new song. That's way too many analogies. But he's new, okay? <laughs> you get that point? Your current circumstances will not get the final say in your life. Man, if anybody could say that, the criminal on the cross can say that. And he's dying. He, he, he's been crucified. But your, fi your current circumstances, however off track they might be, will not get the final say in your life. So Max Cato goes into a little story. He says, picture yourself finally taking that dream vacation, talking about vacations, an African safari. You know, a small group of people being led by a professional through the densest parts of the jungle to see the most exotic things that exist in the world. Uh, you hand your backpack to one of the guys in front of you in line. You're kind of in the back of the line because your boot came untied. Got kind of knotted up, got some stuff messed up, and you just kind of fight it for a minute. You kind of focus on it. You finally get the, the laces straight, get them relaced. The, the one hook thing's kind of flat. So it's a fight. You finally get your boot laced back up. You stand up. And realize they left you. And you listen really carefully, but there's all the noises in the jungle, and you have no idea which way they went. You kind of try to check the ground, but this is truly, they're like hacking through stuff. So you take a guess, and you go the wrong way. You're lost. Feel that a little bit? And he goes, uh, you were not made for this place. <laughs> if you're in the middle of a city, you pull out your phone, GPS, and figure it out. You're not made for the jungle. You're not equipped for this. The guide has all the important stuff. As a matter of fact, the guy you handed your backpack even has your backpack. You're trapped. How do you feel? Fear, anxiety, anger, probably especially hopelessness. He talks a little bit about that, but then he asks, so what do you really need right now? He said three things. First, to be a person. <laughs> you need someone who knows the way out. Duh. He gets paid to write a book just for that. You need some vision. You feel hopeless. You feel lost. You feel done. 
You feel off track with no idea where to go. But you can begin again. You need someone that simply knows where you're headed. You need vision. And lastly, you need direction, how to get there, obviously. Uh, so all of a sudden, they've come back and look for you. They find you. And I love his conclusion to his little example. He says, now, they, now they're there. The jungle is still a jungle. The 29-foot anaconda is still 29 feet long. Nothing has changed. You have changed. I'm sorry, the jungle hasn't changed, but you have. You have changed because your hope has been restored. And you have hope because you have met someone who can lead you out. Isn't that awesome? Criminal is lost. We are lost. But Jesus says, I assure you. I assure you. Whatever your, your arrow looks like, or maybe you have 27 arrows pointing in all different directions today in your life, it feels like. <laughs> or you just stop for a second, take a deep breath out, feel the anxiety a little bit of what you're facing this week or today, and hear Jesus say, I assure you, I am here. Jesus turned to the criminal and said, I assure you, Today you will be with me. A criminal with Jesus. That, does that blow anybody's mind? I assure you, today you will be with me. He had talked to the disciples just earlier. Uh, John 14, John 13, 14, 15, 16. I often say four of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Is Jesus and just the disciples in the upper room right before he goes to the garden to pray, right before he's arrested, right before he's crucified. So some of the juiciest statements, amazing statements in Scripture. He says at the beginning of John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. Seriously, you just told us you're leaving. (laughs) But Jesus said, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me, for there is more than enough room in my Father's house. If this weren't so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? So I'm messing around with you. <laughs> so I have a place. When you, everything is ready, I will come and get you so that where, that you will always be with me where I am. He told the same thing to the disciples. He's telling the criminal, you will be where I am. You will be with me. I assure you, you will be there. This is before the crucifixion. After, about 40 days later, right before the ascension, Jesus says the same thing. Matthew 28, 20, the last verse in Matthew. He says, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. No matter what your age looks like and where you're headed, I will be with you. You can't say it much stronger. Uh, But I think for just my thought on this today, I think a lot of different ways with that. But we talk a lot about spending time with Jesus here. We do think it's important. And uh, this little booklet, My Heart, Christ Home, uh, written uh, the year I was born, a long time ago, uh, is a kind of analogy of you being a house that you own, and you invite Jesus to manage it, to take over, be little, you sign the title over at the end. And he simply walks through, room by room by room, all the rooms of this house that you're turning over to Jesus. They all present a challenge in your mind. Yeah, that's the study. And what you think about, he talks about that. The bedroom, sexual appetites and desires, he talks about that. But this room talks about being with Jesus is not something you have to do. And don't ever hear us say, trying to guilt trip you. You've got to read your Bible every day. No, you get to. And so his point in this is the living room. Uh, we move next into the living room. This is a quiet, comfortable room with a warm atmosphere. I liked it. He had a fireplace, sofa, overstuffed chairs, a bookcase, and an intimate atmosphere. Jesus seemed pleased with it, too. He said, this is a delightful room. Let's come here every day. It's secluded and quiet. We can have good talks and fellowship together. So naturally, as a young Christian, I was thrilled. I couldn't think of anything I'd rather do than spend a few minutes alone with Jesus every day. So, of course, if you read the whole thing, he does that. They have great times. Jesus takes a book of the Bible off the shelf, he says, and reads it. They learn together. They grow together. Uh, But then, as a college student, he just kind of gets busy. And suddenly, he starts leaving their time early to get to some appointment. Matter of fact, he starts missing entire days. 
I mean, if it gets to the point, he rarely has spent a minute with Jesus. We've been there in our quiet times. One morning, I recall rushing down the steps in a hurry to be on my way to an important appointment. As I passed the living room, the door was open. Glancing in, I saw a fire in the fireplace, and Jesus was sitting there. Suddenly, in dismay, it came to me, he's my guest. I invited him into my heart, yet here I am neglecting him. So I stopped, turned, and hesitantly went in. I said, Master, I'm sorry. Have you been here every morning? Yes, he said, I told you I would be here to meet with you. The trouble is, you've been thinking of quiet time, of Bible study and prayer, as a means for your own spiritual growth. That's true, but you've forgotten that this time means something to me also. That this is a book, not scripture, but I don't think anything can be more true. Because Jesus says, I will be with you. At a great cost, I have redeemed you. I value your fellowship. Just to have you look up into my face warms my heart. Everything of that? Don't neglect this hour, if only for my sake. Whether or not you want to be with me, remember, I want to be with you. I really love you. I assure you, today you will be with me. And you probably aren't checking out in the next couple hours like the criminal on the cross. You probably have some days and years ahead. But while that journey continues, will you choose, for Christ's sake, because he desires it, <laughs> will you choose daily to be with him? Jesus said to the thief, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, when he did that sermon on heaven from Colossians 3, uh, I read a lot from, I finished the book, I'd started years before, on heaven by Randy Alcorn. Uh, and we do take a lot for granted. We talk about eternal life, it's, it's real. Talk about heaven, it's there, the realities of heaven. Uh, but how much do you really think about it like Colossians 3 challenges? Uh, so I didn't even put it on PowerPoint. I make you listen. Just the opening paragraphs of the last two chapters of the Bible. In summary, if you read Revelation, we win. Okay? <laughs> it comes out good. I know there's a lot of funky illustrations and word pictures and stuff going on here if you try to read it front to back in Revelation. But here, get here to the end. It's a snapshot of where we end. I assure you, today you will be with me. Well, where? What? In paradise. Take a listen. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the old heaven and old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven like a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. One of those word pictures we'd really wonder exactly what that means. Uh, but something a lot of people don't really think about, that the new Jerusalem would actually come out of heaven and land here on earth. Just fun to, fun to think about. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He'll wipe every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And to the last chapter, chapter 22, the angel showed me a river with the water of life clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. It flowed down the center of the main street. On each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit with a fresh crop each month. The leaves were used for medicine to heal the nations. I just love some of the details. No longer will there be a curse upon anything, for the throne of God and the Lamb, Father and Son, will be there, and his servants will worship him. And they will see his face, and his name will be written on their foreheads. There will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. Then the angel said to me, Everything you have heard and seen is trustworthy and true. I assure you. <laughs> So if you choose to follow Jesus, if you have chosen, if you're thinking about choosing, week at Easter would be a great time to make that decision. Talk to a friend you trust. If you're in that camp, call one of the pastors. But if you choose to follow Jesus, 
I literally think the promise of I assure you, as you follow me, I assure you today, you will be with me. And paradise is going to be awesome. So set your sights there. Live like that is true, because everything indeed is. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you so much for the exact details of so much in Scripture, thinking especially this morning of the Gospels and who Jesus is, what he said, what he did, including, Father, the very words from the cross. And we don't have time to cover all of them in this little mini-series. But the amazing reality of no matter who we are, where we are, what we have done, your grace makes it possible for us to turn to Jesus and say, uh, remember me, Jesus. I want into. And you graciously forgive us, accept us, and give us an incredible promise not only of, et of eternal life, but life in all its fullness here on earth that leads us to your statement of also the assurance that we will be with you forever in heaven. So I just pray for each one here today. I think Easter is a big deal. And uh, maybe it will impact some of our lives like it never has before as we honestly think about it this week and into next weekend. So bless each one here, Lord. For those that have chosen to follow you, they may they sense a security anew today, that you are good, that you're there for us. And for those seeking you, may they continue to ask good questions until they get their answers. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.